establishment of the Mosaic Cordillera is uh, part of a continuum of the development of UP Baguio as a constituent unit in the Cordillera and Northern Luzon. Uh, since the 1980s, we have been doing uh, researches and publishing on Cordillera Studies through the Cordillera Studies Center. The Museo Cordillera complements the Cordillera Studies Center and further fortifies our niche in Cordillera Studies and Indigenous Studies by serving as a platform no, for uh, presenting the research outputs of our faculty uh, through a visual display no, of the of the knowledge that they had created. So the Museo Cordillera is also a platform for the university's interaction or engagement with uh, Cordillera communities and Northern Luzon communities. We did the infrastructure, physical infrastructure development simultaneous with uh, the intellectual infrastructure for it. So uh, first we created uh, a committee composed of uh, consultants from uh, different institutions in Manila. Uh, most of them, all of them were also alumni of UP Diriman uh, from Ateneo, from the Yuchenko Museum and the Lopez Museum, partnering with our local, uh, local faculty, uh, faculty of the UP Baguio. As far as the infrastructure development uh, was concerned, there were more challenges there because, you see, we're not really uh, uh, builders, no? so we had to rely on the expertise of engineers and architects and, um, and, and the, con the contractors, the builders. So there were, there were a lot of delays uh, in, the, in building the infrastructure due to various reasons, delays in the design, uh, delays in implementation due to the typhoons and other disasters that hit Baguio from 2012 no, up to uh, last year. So there were several delays, so it was only uh, this year, January 31, that it was finally uh, inaugurated. It went through a, a participatory and consultative process. That's why it took so long, you know. The conceptualization part started in 2012, immediately after I took over as Chancellor of UP Baguio, through participatory workshops, discussions, roundtable, benchmarking of, uh, of uh, good our best uh, museums here and abroad. This space no, uh, that we are providing for the Museo, in the Museo Cordillera is really going to be an interactive space. No? We want to veer away from the traditional notion of museum as something, uh, as just a display of uh, old artifacts, shelved, no, uh, and, had, and with no interaction with the day-to-day -day lives of people. Uh, from the very people, uh, that uh, where these objects came from, you know, and they are just here in our very region, the Cordillera region. So it's going to be an intertextual uh, space, no, uh, where uh, both tangible and intangible uh, culture of the people here will be uh, showcased. We are, we are going to bring in the the role of new technologies in uh, preserving, in documenting, and displaying, no, uh, all these. Uh, objects of culture, artifacts. No? So there's going to be a digital uh, component of the museum. In fact, we're already uh, starting that by cataloging uh, all the objects. Uh, the museum is going to be a dynamic uh, platform for both uh, traditional as well as contemporary because our view of the museum is consistent with our view of culture, one that is dynamic and constantly changing and adapting to changes in the environment. Welcome to the museum uh, here at Museo Cordillera. We have uh, a museum shop that carries UP Press publications and Cordillera Study Center publications. We also sell um, crafts from our local artists. We also have mugs and other exhibition monographs of the museum. So here, uh, this is the main exhibition hall of the Museo Cordillera. So we have life-size mannequins depicting the traditional tattoos of the Kalinga, uh, Ibaloy, Ifugao, and Bontoc groups in northern Luzon. 
This is based on my book, on my research on traditional tattoos in Kalinga, which is the basis of this exhibition. Here you can see uh, the different traditional tattoo instruments that are used in traditional tattooing in Abra, Kalinga, Montok, Ifugao, and Benguet, including the ink that were used in traditional tattooing. When uh, our curatorial team was thinking about what to exhibit inside the museum, so what was ready and available is my book, so we have to think about how to feature that and how to present that in a way that it will be most appreciated by uh, a lot of uh, people, especially the, the communities that we serve in the Cordillera region. At one point, um, we also had uh, consultants, no? elders as consultants from the communities, and they came here, visited our museum. When they saw the tattooed mannequins, they wanted to erase the whole tattoos uh, on the mannequins because they said that they don't have a tattoo culture. So when we showed the book and I showed them the archival photographs that as early as 1700s, they had ancestors who were tattooed uh, from the head down to the toe, uh, the toe or the full body tattoos. So that's the time where they only realized uh, that the tattooing culture was erased in their memory uh, because of Christianity. We make sure that there is a local collaboration when we set up the research. Uh, we in fact consulted uh, our uh, research collaborators in the field. These are elders, uh, these are uh, uh, local historians, uh, even our faculty, even the families of those who were tattooed were, were consulted. Uh, so their comments are integrated in the captions, even in the exhibition displays of the museum, so uh, we make sure that there is always an engaged uh, collaboration. In fact, we also went against the usual short captions inside museum. We have uh, expanded our texts uh, for our audience to read uh, deeply what these exhibitions are all about. We also produce monographs uh, for, an, for an extended explanation of the exhibition. And they, these are actually sold at a very affordable price, uh, targeting the students so they can bring home uh, to study. Even teachers use these uh, monographs for, uh, for teaching uh, coordinator culture in their schools. Um, the target uh, audience for the Museo Cordillera is actually the young millennials, aside of course from our faculty, uh, students, uh, and other visitors. Because we see that the young millennials have forgotten their culture, so we want to maximize the use of technology. When they come to the museum, they are more interested in doing selfies inside the museum, so you want to tap the technology in deeply appreciating their culture more. So hopefully the young millennials could actually appreciate Cordillera culture specifically and Filipino culture in general. Uh, this is our bedroom of the Museo Cordillera where we feature the different adornments used by uh, other groups in the Cordillera such as the Gadang, Ifugao, and Tingyan in Abra. We also feature here the traditional payments used in traditional tattooing in the past such as the ornaments, uh, clothing, uh, gold and silver ornaments that were used during that time. So these are the Ifugao uh, traditional adornments and the Tingen. Uh, in this section, we also feature some of the manifestations, material manifestation of traditional tattoos and other forms of material culture, uh, such as the bamboo instruments, lime containers, and even shell ornaments in the Cordillera. This also includes uh, the pottery tradition uh, in Kalinga, which has tattoo incisions similar to the body tattoos found in Kalinga. Our first donor uh, in the museum is our national artist for visual arts, Ben Cabrera. He actually uh, gave us one hagabi. This is a prestige bench used by the affluent class in Ifugao society. Our third, uh, second exhibition is on uh, the life works of Jules Derat. Jules is one of our 
uh, faculty at the College of Social Sciences in UP Baguio. He was a missionary anthropologist that came to uh, Northern, Northern Luzon, specifically in Kalinga, to study, to study Buaya society. So here we feature uh, the production of anthropological knowledge uh, through his anthropological fieldwork in Buaya society, such as his slides, uh, his old camera, his maps, and kinship charts are also included in Buaya society. His field notes where researchers and even can the result of his research uh, uh, through his notes. publications. Some of these items are in fact uh, loaned from the uh, CICM diocese in Baguio City uh, where the Belgian missionaries came and brought with them their um, containers no, for their stuff when they do work and missionary activities in Northern Luzon. Our third exhibition is about the photographs taken by one of our faculty, uh, Roland Rabang, on Sagada's Way of Life. This is a, a documentation of uh, the traditional lives in Sagada, despite the modernity that is going on in, in that particular area. So, uh, this was the result of the fieldwork that I did when I was working on my uh, master's thesis in uh, language and literature. So I did a study on uh, the photography of Eduardo Masferre and uh, Tommy Hafalia. So this spread basically was inspired by their photography. So as you can see, um, the, the method that I employed is uh, silver printing, film photography, just because they have also uh, uh, deployed traditional photography in their uh, in their document in, in their documentation. This uh, documentation took place from 2006 to, to 2009, but uh, some of the um, uh, the images that are added into this spread was taken after the after the thesis project. So particularly the the, the La Trinidad and the, the, the Benguet uh, uh, displays. When I first decided uh, to do the field work, um, in the exploratory parts, uh, in the exploratory parts of the research, I did not bring a camera. I, uh, I, did, a, I did not bring a camera uh, because I wanted to introduce myself to the people. I, uh, I, I wanted to get permission if, if only to get their permission, the acceptance is good, the friendship is good, but uh, uh, as, a, as a photographer, I felt uh, that it is the photographer's obligation, not just mine, to get permission before, uh, before uh, you take the photographs. In the process, as you obtain their permission, um, there is a kind of uh, openness. They open themselves up to you. And therefore, the camera now does not become a barrier between, between you as a researcher and as an academic and, and uh, the, the people itself. They, become, they, they begin to see you as, as, as a part of the, 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 entire, um, the entire event that is uh, unfolding. In that manner, uh, it is to the advantage of the photographer, the acceptance, the, the friendship is to the advantage of the photographer because um, um, well, at the very least, they do not mind your presence anymore. They do not, pri they do not mind the presence of, their, of your uh, equipment. And so therefore, if the word is authentic, the, image, the, the images that you get is free-flowing, it's, it's, it's real as it can be, because of the, 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 the absence of the subject's consciousness of what you have and what you're doing. So far as I look back, um, this work began um, over 10 years ago and I feel that uh, uh, I barely scratched the surface. Uh, what I have encountered so far is the, 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 the most common ritual that's, that is held in Sagada Mountain Province, um, which is held six times called the, called the Bagnas. Uh, in, in itself, that ritual is important. They hold, it, uh, they, they hold it six times in a year. That is important because they invoke, uh, 
they invoke um, the intervention of the ancestors and the spirits to keep the community in a constant state of welfare. To me, that's important, but I have not, I, ha I have yet to document, and that's, that's the goal of, of, of this continuing project. I have yet to, um, to, um, to document the ritual they call Dang Tei. Dang Tei happens every, uh, every, every 10 years in Sagada Mountain Province. And so it's due to take place anytime soon, but it has to be uh, ordained by the elders. But this, this ritual is to stake the boundaries of, uh, of Sagada. Sagada. And uh, because uh, it, 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 happen, it happens it, it, uh, um, very rarely, very rarely. It's, it is to me a very important uh, ritual as well. And there are others, uh, there are other uh, little things that take place every now and then. Dao uh, Us, uh, Gubao, the, the ritual of naming uh, uh, a child. Dao Us, the ritual of cleansing. These are the things that, that, that you know, that is in the pipeline as far as this continuing project is concerned. Kapikaan is, um, is, is part of the ritual bugnas. It is part of the ritual bugnas. Um, it is, these are the preparatory stages. These are the preparatory stages of the ritual in which the, a contingent the, of, of the host dap ai. At, uh, in, in this particular photograph, the dapai, or you know, the council, okay, or the the brick and mortar structure, which is the the stones gathered together in which the elders converge. Um, they are preparing to go to a sacred place, okay. They are preparing to go to a sacred grove, in which there they will invoke prayers, okay. They will in, in invoke the presence of the ancestors to say, "Hey, here we are. We are." Uh, we are um, uh, um, uh, we are performing uh, we are performing uh, per performing the ritual called uh, called the bugnas. We call on you to be with us during the during the during the ritual's duration. So, in a sense, um, in, in a sense, um, um, there is this belief among the people of the mountain province that. The spirits are within the community. The spirits are within the community, and therefore, the seen is uh, the unseen is as much a part of the scene. Okay, uh, so so in in fact, there are rules attending um, uh, uh, um, parts of the ritual like this. For instance, for instance. None of your none of your implements, whether the rock or your should 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 fall off, because then but, but then if that happens th that happens it is considered a bad omen, it is considered a sign from the spirits that uh, uh, that they are displeased, and so therefore you have to perform a ritual that will that will counter that that particular omen. So you have to butcher a chicken, something like that. So these are the things that takes place. Okay, beyond uh, beyond the images that we see in these uh, in these photographs. We are glad for what the Museo Cordillera is doing in terms of uh, showcasing uh, studies on traditional Cordillera culture, but uh, I think that. Uh, and, and that is uh, fine and well, and certainly there are more traditional cultures to be to be explored, uh, to be studied more deeply. At the same time, uh, we also observe a uh, progressive and dynamic production of uh, pop culture among the indigenous peoples, and uh, and we can count decades, uh, for instance, of. Uh, the production of popular songs among the indigenous peoples, uh, starting with uh, recording on vinyl discs, uh, and then moving on to tape tapes, cassette tapes, and then to CDs, and then to VCDs, DVDs, and now uploading all of these productions, recycling them, and putting them on YouTube. For me, this is significant because uh, 
because uh, the traditional representation of the indigenous peoples uh, was done mostly by outsiders, by, by scholars, but certainly outsiders. I think that the study of uh, the pop culture production of the Cordillera peoples is, is a study on, on the effort of the indigenous peoples to represent themselves. So uh, let me take the production of pop songs, for example. Definitely uh, in the 70s and 80s, uh, most of the pop songs make use of American country tunes. But the interesting thing is, they don't use uh, the English language in these songs. They use Ibaloy, Kankanaay, Kalamuya. So uh, in that alone, I think, I think they assert uh, who they are by making use of their own language, they assert, they make use of their agency uh, by by appropriating American country music tunes, but but putting it in their own language into the songs and certainly uh, representing their their present experiences in a commercial and globalizing world. In the early decades, uh, the the distribution of these popular songs happened through the radio, and uh, the, the audience feedback, I guess, would be measured by the, by the continuing requests uh, for, for the playing of these songs. Because in the early years, uh, just one or two, one or two of these uh, local songs in the morning, and all the rest would be uh, Ilocano, uh, Filipino, and uh, American pop songs. Uh, but, but that has changed uh, significantly now. Uh, there are instances. Uh, there, there are instances of whole programs dedicated to the playing of uh, Cordillera-produced songs in the various languages. So, so to me, this is an interesting development. Uh, they also have their own uh, most requested songs, their own uh, star singers, and and uh, in fact, they they've been producing uh, music videos of uh, of previously. Uh, recorded songs. So there's this upcycling, recycling of old songs by, by putting in music video and, uh, and uploading, uploading them to YouTube. Some of the earlier productions were done in Metro Manila in some small, <laughs> small studios that accommodated them, <laughs> unknown st studios, but, but they allowed them to record in Manila. Uh, and, but they were refused by the larger studios because they would only record for Nora Honor and Vilma Santos. That's also another interesting story. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, they also have their own systems of production now. They, they bought their own uh, uh, small machines here, so they do the recordings and the productions here. They go up to the Cordilleras for, for the music videos. And yes, they do have their own uh, well, small stars, uh, popular faces, and uh, the people in the villages would uh, would be excited to meet them in person when they do uh, concerts in the villages. But uh, but I think the difference is they don't have a sophisticated marketing uh, strategy to distribute mm -hmm. all of these things. Mm -hmm. So e even small productions are also pirated uh, in the <laughs> in uh, in the urban centers up north. Uh, pirated uh, copies of uh, music and music videos are displayed on the streets along with uh, dried fish, uh, vegetables, uh, other roadsides. So it's a very interesting uh, distribution, circulation of these uh, uh, indigenous productions. I, I speak Ibaloy uh, uh, and that's the language, that, that's the indigenous language of the people of Baguio. And Baguio of course comes from the Ibaloy word Baguio and uh, yeah, and it became Baguio. Uh, but yeah, so uh, a popular Ibaloy pop song would be Savung Shi Bahong, meaning the flowers of Bahong. Uh, Bahong La Trinidad is uh, recognized to be the rose capital of the country. And uh, they, they sing of, of, and of course, uh, just like any other love song, the flower is the, the, is the sign or the symbol for love. So, so they say, uh, Arig mo'y sabsabong na isak si bahong. No kultaan siya, ilaw siya manida, panpipingilan siya. You are like the rose of bahong. That when, when, they, when they harvest uh, the flowers and they bring this down to Dangwa in Manila, 
the the dealers will uh, go and uh, run after after the flowers like that, so something like that. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, UP Baguio uh, has always been uh, open to the performances of indigenous culture, and in fact, we have a program uh, here at UP Baguio. But yes, I, at least for UP Baguio, I I think the students have a regular exposure to indigenous cordillera and other cultures, uh, which is good. Uh, of course, we, we need to see this expand in in, in the entire Baguio, Baguio city. It is supposed to be a uh, culture-rich place, but, uh, but commerce is uh, overtaking culture. <laughs> So welcome to the visible storage of the Musée Cordillera. Uh, this is where we store uh, the artifacts that we study and curate, such as the collection on Cordillera textiles from the different areas in northern Luzon. Uh, these are textiles from Ifugao, Abra, Kalinga, and mountain provinces. So we study these textiles before they get exhibited in our hall. We also have the collection on anthropomorphic carvings uh, from the Cordillera. This is a research collection by our Professor Emeritus Delphine Tolentino who kindly uh, lent us uh, these items for the museum. We also have a collection of basketry uh, from the different areas in northern Luzon. Uh, so this is a uh, these are traditional baskets from Ifugao, used in little locations. We also have musical instruments, like such as gongs and the solibao. And also, uh, we have these small mannequins, uh, which we use for teaching our students, most especially if we have group tours from elementary and high schools in Baguio City and other parts of northern Luzon where they can actually draw their own tattoos and erase it and then uh, to ensure some kind of imagination and creativity in uh, appreciating traditional tattoos in the Cordillera. So uh, we have other collections here such as basketry. Uh, we have a giant backpack uh, upstairs at the main reception hall. So this is the actual size of that particular basket from uh, the mountain provinces. Uh, we also have other collections here. Uh, we also had a basketry workshop, uh, one of our activities at Museo Cordillera where we invited a, bas a basket weaver from Sagada. Our target was actually to produce uh, coffee container but since it's very difficult to make the basket we only produce uh, this particular size so we appreciated uh, how difficult it is to make a basket and uh, it takes a lot of patience to produce uh, baskets in the Cordillera so we have high respect for the artisans in the Cordillera our recent acquisition at the Museo Cordillera are the traditional clothing from Kalinga. This is about 100 years old. So we actually studied this uh, textiles that was worn by, Kal by the Kalinga uh, almost a century ago. So we kept this in a nice uh, 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 cabinet to preserve the color and the weaving of the materials. The third part of our visible storage is where our researchers would come, student volunteers uh, who will conduct uh, research on the different uh, collections in the museum. So this is like the fumigation area where we actually clean uh, artifacts that we collect from the field. We study them, curate them, do the catalog uh, for all of the objects. We are still in the process of acquiring our artifacts, uh, but slowly we are getting there. 
So this is where we keep all our artifacts uh, for study by our researchers, students, and interested scholars. Uh, welcome to the Museo Cordillera. Uh, we would like to invite you to come to our museum. We are very proud of Museo Cordillera because it's a showcase of Cordillera uh, culture. And this is a collaboration between our, uh, between our faculty and the communities that we serve. And uh, it's, a, it's a very good place to stay and look at the exhibition. Okay, hi, uh, I'm Ikin Salvador. I'm the project leader of the Corditex project. So this is an EIDR funded project under the UP system. Uh, the project is called Anthropological Analysis, Mathematical Symmetry, and Technical Characterization of Cordillera Textiles in Northern Luzon. So here we have a team of researchers who are actually analyzing uh, different textiles from Northern Luzon. For instance, we have this uh, universal textile machine and we have here Nats, one of our research assistants from the physics department. Uh, what she will uh, do is actually to get a sample of the thread from the textile and to test that with this machine uh, in terms of the tensile or how strong is uh, the textile used in traditional textiles. So that uh, so we can actually understand how our traditional weavers uh, outsource or uh, use their materials for weaving and how we can help them improve uh, the, the materials that they use later on. Also in the project, we also analyze the uh, designs and patterns in order to preserve them uh, for, uh, for, uh, for their weaving. So here you can see uh, Nat's uh, putting the textile in the machine. There was a time in our history when indigenous communities or ethnic communities, and especially in the peripheries of our nation, were, were not known. No? Uh, or, or whatever knowledge our, our brothers and sisters in the lowlands or in other countries um, have about indigenous communities is one of exoticized identities, marginalized, and uh, poor, no? poverty. as, as uh, as a, uh, stereotypes you know, of indigenous communities. Uh, here, uh, af when we establish the museum, I get to talk to the uh, people who enter the museum, mostly from outside Baguio, from Manila, from the lowland provinces in the Cordillera, and I ask them, so wh what do you think? No, what do you feel about, how do you feel about the museum? And they say, We're, we feel so proud about being Filipino. We didn't realize that our culture is so rich and it's so diverse, and it's uh, it's becoming more clear to us now you know, what it means to be Filipino. And it's interesting to me to find out this this kind of reaction of non-Igorots or non-indigenous peoples uh, identifying with the indigenous uh, peoples and uh, and the objects, you no, know, uh, the, the artifacts of indigenous as their own. You no, know, they own it as part of, the, of, of becoming Filipinos. So, and this is precisely the kind of uh, impact that we want to achieve or outcome that we want to achieve. This, this intercultural dialogue, you know, uh, that, uh, will, that takes place, um, which will acknowledge the diversity of our culture, uh, which actually will 
strengthen our sense of being Filipinos, uh, being being Filipinos or our nationhood. Uh, it's not it's not going to reinforce the otherness or the difference of 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 indigenous and non-indigenous. In fact, it allows for uh, interaction and dialogue and for uh, being, you know, uh, being one as Filipinos, no, regardless of your ethnic identity. I think, uh, well, U UP Baguio is uh, proud at, uh, of its accomplishments uh, to date. Um, we have finally found our niche comfortably and we're comfortable with it. Our uh, niche in Cordillera Studies and Indigenous uh, Studies. And we thank the administration of the system administration in acknowledging this and for, uh, for supporting our contribution in the UP system and in the nation. I think uh, the university is uh, truly fulfilling its role no? uh, as a, a space no? for dialogue, for discussion, for debate, no? uh, both within the university as well as outside of it. We see our role as, uh, as a facilitator, as an animator no? of this intercultural dialogue uh, of course, there are different perspectives on how to uh, how to deal with identities, both individual and collective identities. But uh, and it's good, no? Uh, as a university and as and as a forerunner in liberal education, uh, it is our moral responsibility, in fact, to provide for a space for discussion of these uh, emerging identities. Uh, as well as you know, all the identities, um, and the university should not uh, close its doors. In fact, it should open its door, its doors, no, to these uh, emerging identities, uh, not only uh, national identities but also regional and ethnic identities. I don't see them as threats to our uh, of our uh, to our nation. In fact, it will, to me, if we handle it very uh, carefully then it will in fact strengthen national culture by uh, opening spaces for the communities outside of the rubric of the nation state to actively engage the university and the nation uh, about their issues.